Hey there, SQL enthusiasts. Welcome back to our channel. In this video, we're diving into the five most common mistakes people make when dealing with SQL. We're going to break down each mistake, show you why it happens, and unveil the techniques that'll have you writing queries the right way. But before we dive in, you know the drill. Hit that like button, smash that subscribe, and ring that notification bell so you won't miss a single bit of our enlightening content. All right, let's kick things off with a classic blunder, the wildcard frenzy. The wildcard might seem enticing, displaying all data at once. However, this indiscriminate approach is not recommended. It's like going through a lot of things you don't need just to find what you're looking for, and that's not efficient. Queries become sluggish. Everything slows down and your results might not make much sense. So how to avoid this? Instead of saying, give me everything, be specific. Just like you'd ask for particular books on a shelf, ask for the columns you actually need. This makes your queries faster and your results clearer. Let's look at the following two queries. The first query selects all columns from a table, while the second query only selects the needed columns, which is more efficient. Let's enable time statistics using these commands to see how both queries perform. Now we can execute both queries. If we head over to the Messages tab, you'll see that the first query, where we've used the wildcard, took around 119 milliseconds to complete, while the second query took only 73. It may not seem like a big improvement, but if we have a larger data set and combine these queries with complex joins, you'll notice a huge improvement that comes with being specific about the data you need when querying tables. So, always try to avoid using wildcards and instead, select only the relevant columns to optimize query performance. That wraps up our first stop on this SQL adventure. Let's unravel the mystery of our next mistake, the unholy union. It's all about playing with SQL's union operators, and while it might sound cool, it can lead to some unexpected data surprises if not used correctly. Imagine you have two decks of cards, each with different types of animals. Using the union is like combining these decks into one. But here's the catch. When you use union, it eliminates duplicates, leaving you with a unique set of animals. So if you wanted all animals regardless of duplicates, union isn't your friend. That's where union all comes in. This one doesn't eliminate duplicates. It just combines everything together. So if you have 100 cards in the first deck of cards and 200 in the second deck, your total cards will be 300 regardless of duplicates. Now let's dive into a practical example to understand these concepts better. Here I've prepared a series of queries. The initial two queries are simple selects that fetch the countries where both customers and employees live. Executing these queries yield the following outcomes. In the first set of results, you'll observe various countries, but a handful of duplicates as well, such as France and Venezuela. This outcome has 91 rows. The second set of results focuses on only two distinct countries, the UK and USA, which appear multiple times, culminating in nine rows. Now, the subsequent query employs the union operator to merge the outcomes of the previous queries into a single result set. Running this query presents us with 21 rows. So, what precisely happened here? The union operator combined the outcome of the initial results, set with those of the second, eliminating any duplicates. This explains why we ended up with 21 rows instead of a total of 91 plus 9. To visualize this, we'll apply the distinct clause to the first two queries. This time, the first result contains 21 rows, while the second holds two. Combining both results would theoretically yield 23 rows. However, since the UK and USA appear in both and would create duplicates, they are excluded to maintain uniqueness. Hence, we end up with 21 rows. Now let's delve into the union all operator. Upon executing this query, the outcome consists of 100 rows. Here's the twist. This operator doesn't care about duplicates, so they all stick around. It merged both results without eliminating duplicates. So here's the key. If you're okay with duplicates, pick union all. If you want only unique results, go for union. Remember before diving in, be super clear about whether you want duplicates or not. That wraps it up for the unholy union. Next on our journey, we'll address another cardinal error, the skipping where clause wisdom. This slip up happens when people forget to use the where clause in delete and update commands. It might seem small, but it can lead to big problems by changing more data than you meant to. Visualize this scenario. Within a library, a command is issued to remove all books. The consequence is the removal of the entire literary collection. Similarly, 
When the WHERE clause is omitted from SQL delete and update statements, all corresponding records within the target table are affected leading to extensive data manipulation. And in most scenarios, that's not what you want or need. Let's look at a few examples. The first command removes all rows from the product table, while the second command changes the names of all categories to shoes. Fixing this mistake is simple though. Just remember to use the WHERE clause smartly. This part helps you specify exactly which records should be changed. For example, delete all from the product table where the product ID is 101. This will only delete the row where the product ID is 101. Subsequently, for the update statement, we could say, update the name of the category to shoes where the category name is sneakers. But remember, being careful is also super important. Double check that the where conditions are correct. You wanna be certain that you're only singling out the intended data for modification. A small mistake here can lead to unexpected results that might even affect the integrity of your data. So let's dive into mistake number four, the char versus varchar conundrum. This mistake holds the key to optimizing your data storage and query performance. Imagine you're packing for a trip. You have two suitcases, one fixed in size and another that adjusts to fit your needs. This aligns with the char and varchar data types. Char has a fixed length, while varchar adapts to your data size. Let's say you're creating a column that stores the names of our employees. If you use char with a size of 20, every name in that column will take up the same size of 20, regardless of whether the names are shorter. It's like using a large suitcase for just a few clothes, but with Varcher, the storage amount taken up depends on the size of the data. It simply adjusts to fit, meaning that longer text will take up more storage space than shorter text. Now, here's the problem if you're using char for variable length data, it's like packing an oversized suitcase for a toothbrush. It's inefficient and you're wasting space. On the other hand, using Varcher incorrectly is like trying to stuff a big picnic into a tiny backpack. It just won't fit comfortably. So, how you avoid this? It's all about making the right choice. Use char when your data length is constant and you want predictable storage. Use Varcher when your data length varies and you need flexibility without unnecessary space usage. In essence, your choice hinges on your data's variability and how you intend to use it. For example, here we have the DDL for two tables. The postal code has a fixed format length of five characters. In other words, a postal code will always have five characters. Because of this, it's better to use char instead of varchar. But if we look at username, email, city, and country, they can all have variable length. Hence, we've used varchar for those columns. So remember, Char's predictability can offer a performance edge for fixed-length data, while Varcher's adaptability suits variable-length content. The last mistake you should try to avoid is the null magic gone wrong. Here I've written a query that selects all the people from the person table with a WHERE clause that is supposed to filter the records, so we only have people who do not have a middle name. This is where things get interesting. The null does not conform to conventional data paradigms, in other words, the null is not a value. It's just a question mark that indicates something unknown. So, having used the comparison operator to check whether the middle name is equal to null is a very bad mistake that yields unwanted results, because you cannot compare something against something unknown. To avoid this, use the right syntax. If you want to check whether a column has nulls, use the is null syntax. And if you want to check whether a column does not have nulls, use the is not null syntax. Let's head over to SSMS to look at an example. So, this is the query without the WHERE clause. Notice how I have many nulls for the middle name column. Let's do it the wrong way first and see how it behaves. If I filter out the records to only show the people that do not have a middle name, I end up with the following result, an empty result set. Even if I were to use the not equal to comparison operators, the result will remain the same. Inaccurate and not what we want. So, let's use the proper syntax. If we now change this with is null, we get the expected data. There are only nulls in the middle name column as expected. Subsequently, we can also test for is not null. So, we just need to add the not keyword. This query will retrieve only people that have a middle name. In the realm of SQL, handling null values demands precision. Remember, null isn't a blank, it's a question mark. By using is null and is not null, you unveil this mystery, making your queries sharper and results more accurate. Carry this wisdom forward and master the art of null handling in your data journey. 
So we've come to the end of this video remembering to harness the wisdom we've uncovered here. Let these lessons guide your path and don't repeat these mistakes. If you found these tips helpful, please engage further by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Join us on this continuous exploration of the dynamic world of SQL and beyond. Thank you for embarking on this adventure with us. Until we meet again to explore even more intricacies, may your queries be sharp and your data meaningful.